Hello everyone, welcome to our PowerPoint lecture on operational amplifiers. In this PowerPoint we're going to be covering several different things. Uh, I need you to also remember that there's going to be a lot of information in this PowerPoint that you will see as far as labs are concerned and also for test. So I encourage you to make sure that you review the PowerPoint lecture and I will also upload the PowerPoint itself so you'll have a and make it a little easier to go through certain slides or whatever for review. So we're going to talk about operational amplifiers today and give you an overview of how they function. All right, so as you can see right here, we have our little guy here jumping around and he is outputting some electricity from his body. And some of you should remember from CEN 150 when we talked about what happens when how much or how much static a body can build up with regards to dissipating uh, that static into an IC or something like that. And if you remember, uh, you should remember it was 10,000 volts. So our body can start to charge up a lot of voltage and discharge on ICs. Now, not saying that the op amps are that sensitive to static discharge, but they are an IC. So just keep that in mind when you're dealing with your op amps and other ICs in your kits that you would keep them safe. Uh, so a lot of times we don't have replacements for those and you'll need those for your labs. Okay, let's continue on here. Operational amplifiers, op amp circuits, uh, the inverting amplifier we're going to look at and also the non-inverting amplifier. Okay, the term operational amplifier refers to an amplifier that carries out a mathematical operation which you will see in your upcoming labs uh, and also in the examples when I lecture on some examples of how to wire up your op amps. They are a high gain linear amplifier. Uh, unlike discrete components, uh, resistors, caps, and transistors, op amps are considered ICs because they are all incorporated inside this small little IC, this little, we call it a black box. So that's why we call these ICs. The integrated circuit usually contains one to four op amps per IC and are fairly inexpensive. As you can see in your kits, some of you students, some of the students have already purchased uh, additional 741 op amps for their kits and they were not that expensive. The IC contains multiple transistors, resistors, and frequency compensating capacitors, which we'll talk about later. The characteristics of an ideal op amp. Now the key word here is ideal. Ideal meaning that there are no limitations as far as the output of an op amp, but we know that there are limitations, but when it comes to op amps when they were first to be in design, they were hoping that they can come as close to an ideal op amp as possible, meaning that our gain represented at, as an A is infinite. So we know that this is going to be impossible, which we'll look at later um, for the other characteristics of the op amp. The input resistance would be infinite as well. The output resistance uh, would uh, be zero, which in other words, there would be no load on the op amp itself. It would be carried all the way over to the load itself. Input voltage difference would equal zero. This would be what we consider a differential type input. Uh, input current would also be zero or virtual short. The output voltage limits will be the output of the voltage or the absolute value of the output of the voltage is going to be less than or equal to VCC. VCC meaning that this is the amount of power voltage we're going to hook up to our op amp. And in this op amp, the 741 op amp, we're going to have a VCC input and also a VEE input, which one is positive and one is negative, and we'll see that in a little bit. The typical op amp. This is what the typical op amp usually contains, or is the values of the op amp. The gain is usually uh, greater than uh, 200,000. The input resistance is usually greater than 2 meg ohms. The output resistance is less than 75 ohms, which is still good. Um, and, and just to keep, just to give you a little note on that output resistance. When we build uh, circuits to amplify, let's say, music or something coming out of our uh, stereo or something like that and going into the speakers, we want to make sure that we have impedance matching, meaning that if our speaker is a 6 ohm uh, speaker, then we want to try to make sure that our output resistance is about the same 6 ohms so that we carry that full signal across from the output of the op amp into the speaker itself. 
The input voltage difference is usually going to be less than uh, 0.1 millivolts. The input current uh, difference is going to be usually somewhere around less than 50 picoamps. Our output voltage limits uh, is going to be always uh, less than VCC. In other words, let's say our VCC is set at 15 volts. Uh, the op amp itself is going to drop a little bit. Uh, I am going to give you in a different lecture some notes on that as far as values are concerned of how much we would lose based on the op amp uh, with respect to the output. The typical op amp is a high gain DC amplifier, unstable or un unstable, usable from zero to over one megahertz. Now the frequency on the input is super important. So we need to keep that in mind when we set up our labs. You will be building some labs uh, on, on campus and we'll talk more about that later, but just make sure that you have all your parts. But keep this in mind that there are limitations on the frequency that we're allowed to put into an op amp. The slew rate is the maximum rate at which the output voltage and the op amp can change. In other words, we have a sinusoidal waveform and whatever that value is coming in, we want to make sure that it can change proportionally to the output. If the frequency gets too fast, then our output will actually start to deteriorate or start to uh, shrink as far as the output is concerned. So we, the slew rate is super important and we'll look at that later as well when we do some calculations on slew rate. So here's an example, general purpose op amp 741, the maximum slew rate is 0.5 volts per microsecond, meaning that every 0.5 volts per microsecond, as long as it doesn't go over that, we should be able to have a clean signal coming out of our op amp. Op amps are possibly the most versatile linear integrated circuits used in analog electronics. The op amp is not strictly an element. It contains elements such as resistors and transistors. However, it is a basic building block, just like the resistor, inductor, and capacitor. We treat this complex circuit as a black box, which I said earlier. The op amp is a chip. Uh, a small black box with eight connectors or pins, usually five are only used, and we'll talk about that later as well. The pins and any chip are numbered from one, starting at the upper left hand of the indent or, do or dot, around in a U to the highest pin. Yeah, you should have learned this in digital. We always do our count from left to right in a U-shaped for uh, format. So as you can see, we have our op amp here, and we have eight pins. And we start off with one on the top left, and it, ring, it goes around to eight, number eight on the top right. Also, if you look at the inputs here, pin two is our negative input, pin three is our positive input, and pin four is our, what we call VEE, -E, which is our negative voltage, which is negative 15 in this case. Pin seven is our positive 15 volts, which is VCC. And then, of course, we have our output on pin six. This is the uh, a little bit of a blow up of the block diagram of our internal function of the 741 op amp. Uh, pretty much it just covers everything I just said, other than the fact you might see, you see on pin one and pin five. These refer to as null offsets. And what we do, there's a certain configuration of how we would hook that up with a potentiometer. So this way we're able to adjust the output to where, and the input, to where there's no differential or difference between uh, the negative and the positive coming into our op amp. So basically what happens is, if you remember on the ideal op amp, we wanted it to have a zero on the output for the differential. And this is our way of getting as close as we can by adjusting the null offset so that we have pretty much a zero output uh, if we have two, if the value coming into it is the same. The op amp has two inputs, an inverting input, which is the negative side, and a non-inverting input, which is the positive side, and one output. The output goes positive when the non-inverting input goes more positive than the inverting input, and vice versa. So we have some examples on this. So I'm going to show you some examples uh, on our lecture as far as the notes are concerned. So just hang on uh, till we get to that. The output. Um, the signal, the symbols positive and negative do not mean that you have to keep one positive with respect to another. In other words, 
if you have a negative input on, for instance, right here, where we have V2 showing in our schematic, that doesn't mean that we have to put the negative signal onto that negative input. We can put a positive signal onto that negative input. Just remember that anything's on a negative input is going to be inverted based on the voltage that we have with that's applied to the negative and the positive input. So the symbols, uh, positive and negative, of course, do not mean that we have to keep one respect to the other. They do tell you the relative phase of the output signal. So in other words, if we have a negative on the negative input there of V2, our output is going to be inverted to a positive, okay? All right, op amps are used as amplifiers. Uh, they, need to, they need an external source or constant DC power, which in this case right here, we see typically the source is 15 volts uh, positive and also 15 volts negative. If you look at the top up there where it says positive power, we have a positive 15 volts. And if you look at the lower section of the op amp and the schematic, we have a negative power of negative 15 volts. So in this case right here, our swing from negative to positive is going to be a total of 30 volts peak to peak. So if you look at your output there, it shows a negative 14 and a positive 14. Remember, the ideal op amp would have had that as 15 and 15 on the output. But because of the compensation of the internal resistance of the op amp, we lost approximately one volt on the positive side and approximately one volt on the negative side, giving us a total output swing of 28 volts. That's what you're looking at here. Amplifiers increase the magnitude of a signal by the multiplier called gain, or A. The internal gain of the op amp is very high. The exact gain is often unpredictable. This is usually an open loop gain. In other words, we have no feedback from the output going back into the input. So in this case, it would be open loop gain or what we call intrinsic gain. Our formula for this is V out over V in for gain. Um, and it's usually approximately equals to 10 to the fifth to 10 to the sixth. And we'll talk about more of that, more of that later. The output of the op amp is the gain multiplied by the input. So whatever our gain is, let's just say for instance we have one millivolt coming into our op amp and we have a gain of five so basically we multiply that five times that one and we have five milliamps now on the output the hue the hue gain causes the the huge gain sorry the huge gain causes the output to change dramatically when v1 minus v2 changes changes sign so in other words however the op amp in this case right here the output is limited by the supply voltage which we talked about earlier when the op amp is at the maximum or minimum extreme it is said to be saturated so here are a couple of formulas or basically an overview of the positive saturation values and the negative salvation, uh, negative um, uh, saturation values. So how can we keep this from saturating? Because right now we're talking about open loop gain. In other words, there's no feedback uh, from the output to the input to keep us at a stable value. So what we can do is feedback. Okay, I've said it twice already. So we tie our output uh, through another resistor back to our input. So in this case right here, the, on the left-hand side, the top side, we have negative feedback because it's going, the output is feeding back into our negative side of the op amp. And on the right side, we have a positive feedback because our output is now feeding back into the positive side. Now, just a just, uh, word of caution, Make sure that when you're hooking this up, you hook this up correctly. The op amp in this case right here has just been flipped uh, vertically on the right side. So that doesn't mean that the op amp is, one op amp has a negative on V2 and the other one has a negative on V1, a positive on uh, V1. Which in this case, V1, if you see V1 and V2 have been changed here. So that's really the thing you want to keep in mind. Where is V1 and where is V2 when you look at your circuits? So the negative feedback, uh, as information is fed back, the outcome becomes more stable. Outcome, output tends to stay in the linear range. The linear range is when V out uh, equals the gain times whatever the difference is between V1 and V2. 
uh, versus being in saturation, so it's not running rampant. Examples of this is cruise control, heating, cooling systems. So just keep that. It's kind of like your air conditioning at home. You set the temperature, say it's 70 degrees, and what happens is when it starts to get too hot, it kicks on. When it drops down to a little bit being too cold, it kicks on and starts to heat. So it kind of gives you a, a range of values there for your air conditioning unit as well. In other words, it won't run rapid and just continue to head on up to you know 90 to 100 degrees. Positive feedback, and that was on a negative feedback, which is the most common feedback, by the way. Positive feedback, as information is fed back, the output destabilizes, the op amp tends to saturate, Examples, the guitar feedback, if you guys ever play guitar or have, you know anything about music, the stock market crash, it's kind of like exponential, okay, it just continues to build. So positive feedback was used more, was used before high gain circuits became available. So we will look a little bit at positive feedback, but the primary emphasis on this course for op amps is going to be negative feedback. Okay, op amps use negative feedback. Negative feedback couples the output back in such a way as to cancel some of the input. So in other words, we're maintaining a stability here. Amplifiers with a negative feedback depend less and less on the open loop gain and finally depend only on the properties of the values of the components in the feedback network. Now, the feedback network is something we're going to be doing a lot of calculations on and you'll see that in our lectures with the uh, notes that I give you. The system gives up excessive gain to improve predictability and reliability, which is what we want. We do not want something that's going to be unpredictable. We want to make sure that we can adjust our output and maintain a nice steady output. Op amp circuits can perform mathematical operations, which we talked about earlier on the input signals. So we can add or subtract, we can multiply, divide, there's differential, integration, all these different things, these different functions we can use with an op amp based on our inputs. Other common uses include impedance buffering, uh, ability to isolate a load from a source. So same thing we talked about before with the speaker systems. Uh, we want to make sure that we have impedance matching so as to carry the full power, the full load from the op amp output to the speaker itself. Then we have active filters, active controllers, uh, analog digital interfacing. So there's a lot of different common uses that we can use for op amps. So here we have a typical circuit of an op amp hooked up. Uh, we have some feedback, okay, coming back to this. So this is a negative feedback. As you can see, the output, pin six, is feeding back into pin two, which is the inverting leg. So we have a negative feedback in this case. And if you look at the circuit, there should be something that doesn't seem to sit well. Okay, there's something that's not right with this circuit. So the thing we want to look at is our supply voltages. Now, before we talked about the, what we had earlier with using 15 volts on the positive side, the VCC, and the negative 15 volts for the VEE on the bottom side of the op amp. So in this case right here, we want to make sure that our VCC, in this case, is 9 volts DC. So let's take a look at the 9 volts DC up there at the top, the positive side. So the positive side of that 9 volts is feeding into the positive side of the op amp. Okay, this is correct. So we want to make sure that when we hook up our VCC and our VEE, our, yeah, our VEE, that we are hooking the polarities up correct. Now. On the, bottom si on the bottom side there, we see a, uh, our negative volts uh, at the, uh, going into our negative side of the op amp for the VEE, but the polarity on that negative d volts DC is positive that's feeding back into our negative side of the op amp. And this is not the correct way to hook up this op amp. So this is just an example. Uh, usually if we're in class, you know, you guys can look at this and I can ask you, hey, you know, do you see any problems with this circuit? This is the problem with this circuit. The negative nine volts that's uh, being fed into the negative side of the op amp has the positive of that supply going in and it should be flipped vertically where, it, where the negative supply goes into the op amp. So keep that in mind. Uh, when we have labs, I'll make sure that you understand how to hook your positive and negative up to your op amps.
All right, so our inverting op amp, here we have our feedback coming back into our um, inverting side, which is the negative side. So we have RN, which is our input going into the op amp, and then we have our feedback resistor, which is above the op amp. And if you look, our V out formula, basically that negative there in front of the formula just represents that it's gonna be inverted. Okay, so in other words, how do we find out what our value is gonna be coming out? We take our RN, divide it into our RF. That's gonna give us our total gain, as you can see on the right-hand side. And then on the left-hand side, we multiply that, that gain times our VN. And this will give us the value of our voltage coming out of this circuit. Now, this value will be inverted uh, because it is on the inverting input of the op amp. The non-inverting amplifier, as you can see, we got our feedback coming out and going into our negative side, but in this case right here, our input is coming into the non-inverting side, giving us a non-inverting uh, output. So usually we don't hook up circuits this way. They're not as stable if you remember, but our formula for V out here in this case is one plus the RF divided by RG and multiply that times our VN, okay? And our gain, of course, is always gonna be unity at least, one plus RF divided by RG. There are several stages of the op amps. There is the diff amp, the differential amp, more stages of gain, and there's a class B push-pull emitter follower. Now, you should have had some uh, training in this with analog one when you looked at transistors, but we are gonna look a little bit more into this. We will do a diff amp with transistors just to give you an idea of how the internal workings of an op amp actually work. But please remember these layouts and uh, this information for this because you may see it again. All right, so here is our differential amplifier. What I want you to notice is that both of these are uh, 2N3904 amplifier transistors and we have the same values on the base of each. We have both of them are 33K ohms, excuse me. And then R3, uh, we call our, our, basically our tail current, is 15K, which is fed into the, both of the emitters. So it is the same. What makes it a little bit different is that on, the, on Q2, on the output where the collector is, there is a value, there's R1, which is 15K. Now, this R1 is going to give us a little bit of difference for V out, but what I want you to understand is that typically when you see the same values of inputs on the base and the same values on the emitter, you can basically say that there should be zero coming out of this op amp. But because we have R1 in, in, in series with the collector on Q2, we are gonna have a little bit of a difference on our output. So this is what we refer to as a differential amplifier. So we're gonna look how to hook this up and do some calculations on this type of circuit because this is important because this is the functioning or how the op amp actually functions internally. All right, now common mode gain. Uh, this refers to applying the same signal to both bases at the same time so that there is no offset voltage. The output voltage theoretically will be zero, kind of like what we just said on the differential op amp using the uh, transistors. Common mode rejection ratio, this is the ratio of differential voltage gain to common mode voltage gain. In other words, if the diff amp were perfect, the common mode rejection ratio would be infinite because the common mode gain would be perfect. So our formula for that would be CMRR, common mode rejection ratio, is gonna be our gain divided by the common mode gain. And then if we wanna know what the common mode gain is, of course, we would just take our gain divided by CMRR. And we will have examples on this, so. All right, and that concludes our PowerPoint lecture. Please make sure that you uh, review these this, these slides. Uh, like I say, I'm going to be uploading the PowerPoint as well so you, that you have information to review for yourself. But you will see this information again. We will, you will need to understand what we just talked about here. It's going to help you out with your labs and also with the lectures that we will cover um, in this first week as well. All right, and I will talk to you again soon.